President Biden's latest budget calls for maintaining and even expanding the social safety net, although it seeks to limit Medicare spending through tougher bargaining over drug prices. It nonetheless claims to reduce budget deficits, mainly by raising taxes on corporations and Americans with incomes over $400,000 a year. For now, it's a sensible approach, especially given the political realities. And it's especially sensible compared with the mean-spirited nonsense coming from Republicans. But in the long run we'll need more. Despite what very serious people still say, we don't need to cut benefits. But we will need to be aggressive about controlling health costs, and we'll also need more revenue, which will almost surely require raising taxes on some Americans who make less than that $400,000 threshold. Let me walk through how I see the math. First, we don't currently face a debt crisis, nor are we likely to face such a crisis anytime soon. Many people I talk to find this hard to accept, saying something along the lines of, I can't believe that $31 trillion in debt isn't a crisis. But you shouldn't base economic policy on arguments from personal incredulity. And it's always important to remember that while our debt is huge in absolute terms, so is everything about the US economy, so citing big numbers without context isn't helpful. In fact, here's a pro tip, anyone who makes alarmist claims about debt by talking about trillions of dollars as opposed to, say, percentages of gross domestic product, is engaged in scare tactics, not serious discussion. If we do look at debt as a percentage of GDP, it's indeed high, but not outside ranges that other countries have managed without crisis. Here is one comparison I like, between the current US debt level and Britain over the past 250 years. Actually, the US number is slightly understated, because it's only federal debt and doesn't include state and local debt. Yet the basic point should be clear. Britain spent large parts of both the 19th and 20th centuries with debt well above current US levels, but without experiencing a severe debt crisis. Still, even those of us who reject deficit scare talk generally think that at some point we'll have to stabilize the ratio of debt to GDP making that case is trickier than you might think, but let's set that aside for today and focus on the practical element. What would stabilizing that ratio involve? It would not mean balancing the budget. Because GDP grows over time, a stable debt ratio can be achieved even with growing debt, as long as the growth is no faster than that of GDP. Right now, we have debt that's roughly 100% of GDP, a reasonable long-term projection for long-term GDP growth is 4% a year, half real growth, half inflation, so we could hold the line while adding debt, that is, running deficits, of 4% of GDP each year. Actual deficits are, however, somewhat bigger than that, the Congressional Budget Office expects a deficit of 5.3% of GDP this fiscal year. That's not a huge gap, but we're on a trajectory that will, absent policy changes, make the debt-to-GDP ratio worse. The reason is the combination of an aging population and the likelihood, again, in the absence of policy changes, of rising healthcare costs. Here is my favorite chart from the C.B.O.S. long-term budget outlook, showing projected increases in social spending and their causes. These projections suggest that the fiscal gap, the difference between the actual budget deficit and the deficit consistent with a stable debt ratio, will eventually rise by more than 5% of GDP. Since we already have a gap of 1 to 2 points, we're looking at an eventual gap of, say, 6 to 7 points. How can that gap be closed? Controlling health care costs, eliminating most or all of the additional cost growth in that chart, could be a large part of the answer. It's always important to realize that American health care is wildly more expensive than health care in other advanced countries, without achieving meaningfully better results. So if we're willing to take real action on health costs, not just bargaining over the prices of drugs, but also learning to do things like saying no to expensive procedures of dubious medical value, we should be able to avoid most or all of that additional cost growth. Yes, 
It will be hard, but not as hard, or as cruel, as simply kicking people off Medicare and Medicaid, which seems to be the Republican solution. But even if we can control health costs, adding the effects of an aging population to the fiscal gap we already have will still mean a fairly large fiscal gap several decades from now, say, for 5% of GDP. If we want to preserve benefits, we'll have to close that gap with additional revenue. Can all of that revenue come from taxes on very high incomes? Unfortunately, I don't think so. I've been playing around a bit with internal revenue service tax data, I'm sure that actual tax economists can do a more sophisticated analysis, but here is a quick and dirty approach. Let's approximate a strategy of taxing the rich with one of raising taxes on ordinary income that's already being taxed at a 35% or 37% rate, in other words, the income of the highest earners, and capital gains taxed at 20%, the type of investment income also enjoyed by wealthier Americans. Harris total income, in 2020, in those three categories, net of the federal taxes they're already paying, as percentages of G.D.P., in other words, the remaining untaxed income of the rich. The total income there, if I'm doing the sums right, is about 6.5% of GDP. But the amount of money we could raise with higher taxes on this income is surely considerably less than this total, even in the unlikely event that we tried to tax all of it. For one thing, this is the income net of federal taxes, some of that income is already being paid in state and local taxes. Probably more important, very high marginal tax rates create problematic incentives. Conservatives emphasize how taxes reduce the incentive to work and create wealth, this effect is surely overrated, but it does exist. More important, high tax rates encourage extraordinary efforts to avoid taxes, which is legal, or evade them, which isn't. Estimates of the revenue-maximizing top tax rate tend to be in the range of 70% to 80%, well above the federal maximum of 37%, but bear in mind that many high earners also face state and local taxes that raise their effective marginal rate to something like 50%. So the amount of additional revenue we can raise from taxing the rich, while substantial, is considerably less than their remaining untaxed income. It may be as much as 2% of GDP, but that won't be enough to close the long-run fiscal gap. My bottom line is that, yes, we can preserve Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security without benefit cuts through a combination of cost control and tax hikes, but that will eventually have to raise taxes, at least somewhat, on people making less than $400,000. The operative word, however, is, eventually. Put it this way, Broader tax hikes can wait until U.S. politics become less poisonous. And if they don't become less poisonous, fiscal gaps are going to be the least of our problems. Next week I'm giving a talk on journalism and democracy, and I thought I would use the newsletter this weekend to think out loud about the subject. Much of the conversation around journalism and democracy concerns the problems of misinformation, disinformation and partisan silos. How do we ensure that Americans are getting accurate information? How do we help people resist conspiracy theories? How do we encourage readers and viewers to engage with perspectives outside their own? I think these are important questions. But to the extent that the crisis in American democracy is shaped by the modern information environment, I don't think the problem is misinformation, disinformation or partisan silos, because we've always had misinformation, disinformation and partisan silos. The information environment of the early American Republic, the first years of the Constitution, leading up to the election of 1800, was saturated with conspiracies and misinformation. For all intents and purposes, there was no press but the partisan press well into the 19th century, to the extent that local political machines produced their own newspapers for their supporters and patrons. And conspiracies, again, were the common currency of American politics. 
We tend to remember the 20th century as the age of the broad-minded and objective journalist, but until the Second World War, the information environment of American life looked much like it did in the previous century, with tabloids and broadsheets competing with partisan outlets and ideological journals. Our world of misinformation, disinformation and partisan news is a departure from the years during which a handful of large institutions dominated national newsmaking, but it's a return to the world before those years, when the information environment was fractured and often unreliable. If our information has almost always been fractured and unreliable, then our particular information environment can't actually explain the problems facing American democracy. In Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville examines the role of the free press in American democracy. Newspapers both provide information for the people and are constitutive of the people themselves. It would diminish, newspapers, importance to believe that they serve only to guarantee freedom, they maintain civilization. What Tocqueville means is that by disseminating information about the community and revealing the state of the community to itself, the free press helps constitute the groups and associations that act on that community and within it. If there were no newspapers, he writes, there would almost never be common action. It often happens in democratic countries, he continues, a vibrant press is one of the forces that help shape individuals into members of a community with responsibilities and obligations toward that community. It acculturates them into political life and ties them to other, like-minded people. That's one reason that throughout American history, whenever there is a reform movement, there are newspapers and journalists associated with that reform movement, whether it's the temperance movement or the abolition movement or the labor movement. One of the most striking aspects of the modern information environment, as many people have observed, is the almost total collapse of local and even regional news outlets. Where once every town or city of even minor consequence had a newspaper, with reporters who helped the community understand itself through their work, now there are large parts of the country that exist in news deserts, where there is little coverage of anything, from local government to local events. I think that this decline has played an important role in undermining America's democratic institutions, as well as the public's faith in democracy. It's not just that the collapse of local news has made it harder to hold any number of public officials accountable, contributing to general cynicism about the ability of government to do anything constructive but that Americans increasingly lack the information they need to participate in the political process in their communities. As Americans have shifted away from local news, turnout in state and local elections has fallen, notes Brookings, and communities that have lost reporters have seen fewer candidates run for local office. Americans have turned to national news and national news outlets to close the gap, but these larger institutions can't replace what has been lost. By virtue of proximity, I can respond more easily when a local official is accused of wrongdoing. The same isn't true of a member of Congress, especially if they aren't my own. The information we get from national outlets is valuable, but it can also leave us feeling hopeless and impotent. And it can contribute to political hobbyism a tendency to treat politics not as a cause for action and an essential part of citizenship, but as a game where the only goal, the only objective, is to somehow embarrass and humiliate our enemies. There has always been an element of entertainment in politics, it's part of living in a mass democracy, but the total devolution of politics into entertainment may have something to do with the absence of institutions that link our political awareness to something more local, something more concrete, than national political conflict, there's much more to say on journalism and democracy. But this, at least, is where my thoughts begin. I still have a few days before my talk, we'll see where they go from here. The month after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, a mother of two in Texas who had filed for divorce from her husband discovered she was pregnant. 
Determined not to have another child and worried that her husband would try to use the pregnancy to make her stay with him, she did what many of us would do and turned to two friends for help. In text messages that are now part of a chilling lawsuit, her friends responded with warmth and solidarity. One told her about Aid Access, an organization based in Vienna that ships abortion pills to people in places where abortion is banned. Then the same friend texted that she had found someone nearby who could supply the medication. She and another friend both offered to let the woman go through the abortion at their homes. Mistakes happen, the second friend texted. You can't spiral. Hopefully this is the slap in the body that you need to remove yourself from him. Now the ex-husband, Marcus Silva, is getting his revenge. Last week, he filed a wrongful death lawsuit against his ex-wife's two friends and the woman who allegedly provided the abortion pills his ex-wife took, seeking a million dollars from each of them. Because the suit seems likely to send abuse their way, in not including the women's names. Silva's case appears to have the backing of the anti-abortion movement, since he's being represented by Jonathan F. Mitchell, the former Texas Solicitor General who devised Texas Abortion Bounty Law, which gives private citizens the power to sue others for conduct that aids or abets the performance or inducement of an abortion. His legal team also includes Briscoe Kane, a prominent abortion opponent in the Texas House, and three members of the Thomas More Society, a right-wing Catholic legal organization. Assisting a self-managed abortion in Texas, says the lawsuit, is an act of murder. This case has several harrowing implications. First, it makes particularly vivid the way abortion prohibitions give men control over women. In the text messages reproduced in the lawsuit, Silva's ex-wife wrote, of her pregnancy, that she knew Silva would use it against me and try to act like he has some right to the decision. Given that he is now suing her friends, she seems to have understood him well. What she might not have understood is how much political power he'd be able to muster on behalf of his patriarchal prerogatives. According to Melissa Murray, a law professor at New York University, it's significant that the lawsuit wasn't filed under Mitchell's abortion bounty law. Instead, it's a wrongful death case, which Murray sees as a bid to win judicial recognition of fetal personhood in Texas law. Texas may prohibit abortion, but not on the grounds that it is a species of homicide, that is, the killing of a person, she said. Texas lawmakers have, in the past, introduced legislation classifying abortion as homicide, which would make either having an abortion or performing one punishable by the death penalty, but the bills have never succeeded. If the idea of fetal personhood is normalized in the law through wrongful death cases like Silva's, applying murder statutes to abortion becomes easier to imagine. Jonathan Mitchell is playing five-dimensional chess with this, Murray said. It's hard to say whether the lawsuit has a chance, since that will depend on which judge hears it. Joanna Grossman, a visiting law professor at Stanford, found the filing absurd saying, it's not written in a way to convince anybody about a serious legal argument. But far-right judges don't necessarily need serious legal arguments. After all, in another Texas lawsuit, we're waiting to see whether a federal judge appointed by Donald Trump takes the unprecedented step of revoking FDA approval of the abortion drug Mifepristone. There are lots of judges, said Grossman, just doing the bidding of the anti-abortion movement. Whatever happens legally, the message to women in states with abortion bans is unmistakable, you're on your own. No one is going to follow whether this ex-husband collects damages for this abortion, said Grossman. They're just going to see the news that the women accused of helping Silva's ex-wife were publicly humiliated and put in grave financial jeopardy, and they're going to think twice about confiding in their friends about an unwanted pregnancy.
Mitchell's trying to get at the whole information network, so that people really, truly are isolated emotionally and can't trust anybody, said Grossman. Israeli President Isaac Hordzak has called the national upheaval over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's assault on the judiciary a national nightmare. Ongoing mass demonstrations were joined by hundreds of thousands on Saturday night. And after violence by Israeli settlers, fears have intensified that Israel is heading toward a third intifada. Now comes news that fierce foes Iran and Saudi Arabia are re establishing relations. This might be the biggest blow of all to Netanyahu, who fancies himself a diplomat who can make peace with Arab neighbors, forge an alliance against Iran and put off indefinitely any prospect of Palestinian statehood. From the perspective of the United States, a lowering of tensions between Iran, the leading Shiite power, and Saudi Arabia, the leading Sunni state, may be a positive development, although the arrival of China, which brokered the deal, as a major player in the region can hardly be encouraging. But Netanyahu has reason to see things differently. However, the Saudi-Iran agreement might be less than it seems. Veteran Middle East diplomatic Dennis Ross told me it is really not a rapprochement. The Saudis, he said, want to find out if the Iranians are willing to limit what the Houthi rebels do in Yemen. They would like to be out of Yemen, or at a minimum to keep the Houthis in a ceasefire, Ross said. For their part, the Iranians want to show they are not isolated in the region, he said. But, the fundamentals in the Saudi-Iranian relationship have not changed, the last thing Netanyahu wants, however, is to see the Saudis repair relations with Israel's archenemy, and to deflect criticism would prefer to blame supposed Saudi concerns about U.S. weakness. For someone who continually crows about the Abraham Accords and hints he will normalize relations with Riyadh, Netanyahu appears to have been caught off guard by the move. The Saudis and Iranians' grip and grin undercuts his claim to international prowess. As he is prone to do when things go badly, he lashed out at others, in this case the United States, claiming the deal resulted from weakness shown by the Biden administration and the previous Israeli government. Nevertheless, the surprise Saudi-Iran pact feeds the perception that Netanyahu is leading Israel toward greater chaos and turmoil. As Stephen A. Cook, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, explained, Netanyahu has told Israelis that he is the guy who is going to make peace with the Saudis, which would cement Israel's place in the region and bring an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict once and for all. Moreover, by easing Iran's international isolation, the Saudi move may stymie Netanyahu's desire to heighten confrontation with Tehran. Brian Cachalis, senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, said this is one of the reasons why he and his echo chamber are critical. Netanyahu's domestic opponents are only too happy for the opportunity to excoriate the prime minister. Yair Lapid, the former leader, denounced the deal as the complete and dangerous failure of the Israeli government's foreign policy. This is what happens when one deals with legal insanity all day instead of doing one's job against Iran and strengthening relations with the United States, he said. Naftali Bennett, Lapid's partner in the previous government, called the pact a resounding failure for Netanyahu. Countries in the world and the region see Israel divided with a non-functional government, focused on serial self-destruction, he said. Netanyahu has already been playing defense against widespread domestic and international criticism. He has tried to give the impression that he is open to compromise on the judicial reform plan that has provoked protests, and he has paid lip service to Herzog's efforts at mediation. However, in denouncing peaceful protesters as anarchists and comparing them to the marauding settlers on the West Bank, Netanyahu has, intentionally or not, undermined efforts to cool tempers. Netanyahu's reputation as a strong leader who can bring security, prosperity, and international respect is in tatters. 
he seems determined to pick fights with the United States despite President Biden's considerable restraint in responding to his assault on the judiciary and confrontation with the Palestinians. Driven by arrogance, contempt for critics and thirst for power, Netanyahu has always been his own worst enemy. Tragically, he may now be Israel's as well. So the Fed stepped in to protect all deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, even though the law says that deposits only up to $250,000 are insured and even though there was a pretty good case that allowing big depositors to take a haircut wouldn't have created a systemic crisis. SVB was pretty sway generous, far more exposed both to interest risk and to potential runs than any other significant bank, so even some losses for larger depositors may not have caused much contagion. Still, I understand the logic. If I were a policymaker, I'd be reluctant to let SVB fail, merely because while it probably wouldn't have caused a wider crisis, one can't be completely certain and the risks of erring in doing too much were far smaller than the risks of doing too little. That said, there are good reasons to feel uncomfortable about this bailout. And yes, it was a bailout. The fact that the funds will come from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which will make up any losses with increased fees on banks, rather than directly from the Treasury doesn't change the reality that the government came in to rescue depositors who had no legal right to demand such a rescue. Furthermore, having to rescue this particular bank and this particular group of depositors is infuriating, just a few years ago, SVB was one of the mid-sized banks that lobbied successfully for the removal of regulations that might have prevented this disaster, and the tech sector is famously full of libertarians who like to denounce big government right up to the minute they themselves needed government aid. But both the money and the unfairness are really secondary concerns. The bigger question is whether, by saving big depositors from their own fecklessness, policymakers have encouraged future bad behavior. In particular, businesses that placed large sums with SVB without asking whether the bank was sound are paying no price, aside from a few days of anxiety. Will this lead to more irresponsible behavior? That is, has the SVB bailout created moral hazard? Moral hazard is a familiar concept in the economics of insurance. When people are guaranteed compensation for losses, they have no incentive to act prudently and in some cases may engage in deliberate acts of destruction. During the 1970s, when New York, in general, was at a low point and property values were depressed, the Bronx was racked by fires, at least some of which may have been deliberately set by landlords who expected to receive more from insurers than their buildings were worth. In banking, insuring deposits means that depositors have no reason to concern themselves with how the banks are using their money. This in turn creates an incentive for banks to engage in bad behavior, such as making highly risky but high-yielding loans. If the loans pay off, the bank makes a lot of money, if they don't, the owners just walk away. Heads, they win, tails, the taxpayers lose. This isn't a hypothetical case, it's pretty much what happened during the SVL crisis of the 1980s, when savings and loan associations, especially but not only in Texas, effectively gambled on a huge scale with other people's money. When the bets went bad, taxpayers had to compensate depositors, with the total cost amounting to as much as $124 billion, which, as an equivalent share of gross domestic product, would be something like $500 billion today. The thing is, it's not news that guaranteeing depositors creates moral hazard. That moral hazard is one of the reasons banks are regulated, required to keep a fair bit of cash on hand, limited in the kind of risks they can take, required to have assets that exceed their deposits by a significant amount, aka capital requirements. This last requirement is intended not just to provide a cushion against possible losses but also to give bank owners skin in the game, an incentive to avoid risking depositors' funds, since they will have to bear many of the losses, via their capital, if they lose money. The savings and loan crisis had a lot to do with the very bad decision by Congress to relax regulations on those associations, 
which were in financial trouble as a result of high interest rates. There are obvious parallels to the crisis at Silicon Valley Bank, which also hit a wall because of rising interest rates and was able to take such big risks in part because the Trump administration and Congress had relaxed regulations on mid-sized banks. But hey race the thing, the vast bulk of deposits at SVB weren't insured, because deposit insurance is capped at $250,000. Depositors who had given the bank more than that didn't fail to do due diligence on the bank's risky strategy because they thought that the government would bail them out, everyone knows about the FDIC insurance limit, after all. They failed to do due diligence because, well, it never occurred to them that bankers who seemed so solid, so simpatico with the whole venture capital ethos, actually had no idea what to do with the money placed in their care. Now, you could argue that S.V.B.S. depositors felt safe because they somewhat cynically believed that they would be bailed out if things went bad even if they weren't entitled to any help, which is exactly what just happened. And if you believe that argument, the feds, by making all depositors whole, have confirmed that belief, creating more moral hazard. The logic of this view is impeccable. And I don't believe it for a minute, because it gives depositors too much credit. I don't believe that S.V.B.S. depositors were making careful, rational calculations about risks and likely policy responses, because I don't believe that they understood how banking works in the first place. For heaven's sake, some of S.V.B.S. biggest clients were in crypto. Need we say more? And just in general, asking investors, not just small investors, who are formally insured, but even businesses with millions or hundreds of millions in the bank, to evaluate the soundness of the banks where they park their funds is expecting too much from people who are, after all, trying to run their own businesses. The lesson I would take from SVB is that banks need to be strongly regulated whether or not their deposits are insured. The bailout won't change that fact, and following that wisdom should prevent more bailouts. And you know who would have agreed? Adam Smith, who in The Wealth of Nations called for bank regulation, which he compared to the requirement that urban buildings have walls that limit the spread of fire. Wouldn't we all, even the ultra-rich and large companies, be happier if we didn't have to worry about our banks going down in flames? Right-wing House Republicans have left little doubt that they want to spend the bulk of their time and energy investigating phony conspiracies and made-up scandals. Their main obsession appears to be Hunter Biden, whose very name has become a buzzword in right-wing media. The contents of one of his laptops, revealed in 2020, have inspired a fantastical conspiracy theory that has been comprehensively debunked by, among others, Asha Rangappa a senior lecturer at Yale University's Jackson School of Global Affairs and former FBI agent. She persuasively applies a, a basic three-part formula employed by psychologists who study conspiracy theories for disentangling truth from fiction, one that activates the rational, analytical side, rather than the lizard, fight-or-flight side, of the brain. Her takeaway the conspiracy theorists have reached the temper tantrum stage of the Hunter Biden scandal. Obviously, there is no legitimate basis for congressional oversight of the matter. And that brings us to the current face-off between the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committees, on one side, and 50 or so former intelligence officials, on the other. In October 2020, these officials crafted a statement that appeared in Politico alleging that appearance of the laptop and emails purporting to relate to Hunter Biden's time on the board of a Ukrainian gas company, Burisma, has all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. As my post colleague Glenn Kessler has explained, the statement's claims, in contrast to news reports and Democrats' description of the claims, were explicitly limited. 
We want to emphasize that we do not know if the emails provided to the New York Post by President Trump's personal attorney Rudy Giuliani are genuine or not and that we do not have evidence of Russian involvement, just that our experience makes us deeply suspicious that the Russian government played a significant role in this case, the statement cautioned. Nevertheless, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan, Republican Ohio, and Intelligence Committee Chairman Michael R. Turner, Republican Ohio, sent letters to the signatories, demanding all documents relating to the statement and directing the former officials to appear for transcribed interviews. If they don't comply, they have been warned, subpoenas will be forthcoming. Perhaps Republicans imagine the former intelligence officials were put up to signing the statement pointing the finger at Russia as part of a Democratic plot to mislead voters. Talk about projection. Whatever the reason for this GOP fishing expedition, it would be a dangerous threat to the First Amendment if Congress could haul in for questioning any private citizen, as the former officials were at the time, to explain an op-ed or open letter. And, ironically, it would be an illegitimate and inappropriate use of congressional power, a weaponization of government, if every president's family members and their associates and defenders could be summoned to testify about a made-up controversy. Several of the signatories are represented by Mark Zaid, who provided me with a copy of a letter challenging the fishing expedition. In a response to the chairman, Zaid notes that the power of Congress to exercise oversight is not unbounded. Citing the 2020 Trump v. Mazar's Supreme Court case, Zaid explains that Congress needs a legitimate legislative purpose to demand compliance with a subpoena. And here, no conceivable legislative purpose exists, he says, only a purely political, partisan exercise that wastes taxpayer money. Indeed, it is hard to divine any legislative purpose for a Republican-led, contorted investigation of the president's son. But I cannot say the maneuver surprises me. House Republicans have continually boasted about their plans to investigate President Biden and his family, meddle in ongoing prosecutions and run interference for former President Donald Trump. Now, their admission is being turned against them. It isn't clear where this is going from here. Zaid says his clients have voluntarily agreed to produce documents. One signatory, Mark Polymeropoulos, who helped organize the former intelligence official's statement, has agreed to sit for an interview. However, should the committees issue formal subpoenas to others or demand the former officials reveal classified information about their past service, which is the basis for their opinions set out in the statement, the issue likely would head to the courts in the first substantial legal challenge to the House GOP's conspiracy-driven inquests. The last thing these right-wing congressmen likely would want is a court ruling that their three-ring circus lacks any legitimate legislative purpose and, therefore, cannot compel testimony or document production. A legal defeat for mega-inspired investigations, which to date have spectacularly flopped, would be the perfect denouement to Republicans' inept efforts to harness congressional power for political gain. If their power to hold hearings is neutered, the absence of a substantive House GOP mission would be laid bare. Republicans would be left to make wild accusations, such as bank failures are due to wokeness, advance a hugely unpopular agenda, restricting abortion, raising prescription drug prices, and reveal their disarray, as they have with the debt ceiling. In standing up to congressmen bent on bullying and intimidating witnesses to score political points, the former intelligence officials will have performed a public service, revealing the feckless little men behind the curtain. Donald Trump may finally be indicted. Finally. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has signaled that charges, related to Trump's reported hush money payments to the porn star Stormy Daniels, are likely. But there's also hand-wringing, about whether this is the best case to be the first among those in which Trump is likely to be criminally charged, the strength of this case compared to others and the historic implications of indicting a former president for anything. 
And with regard to those implications, the central considerations always seem to be the importance of any precedent set by prosecuting a former president and the broader political significance, what damage it might do to the country. Often left out of that calculus, it seems to me, is the damage Trump has already done and is poised to continue to do. Prosecution is not the problem. Trump himself is. And any pretense that the allegations of his marauding criminality are a sideshow to the political stakes and were, therefore, remedied in 2020 at the ballot box rather than in a jury box, is itself a miscarriage of justice and does incalculable damage. Last year, Around the time the House January 6 committee was holding hearings, Elaine Kamark, the founding director of the Center for Effective Public Management at the Brookings Institution, wrote, Prosecuting Trump is not a simple matter of determining whether the evidence is there. It is a question embedded in the larger issue of how to restore and defend American democracy. I don't see it that way. Any case against Trump must hang on the evidence and the principle that justice is blind. The political considerations, including gaming out what might be the ideal sequence of cases, across jurisdictions, and by their gravity, only serve to distort the judicial process. The justice system must be untethered from political implications and consequences, even the possibility of disruptive consequences. For instance, could an indictment and prosecution of Trump cause consternation and possibly even unrest? Absolutely. Trump has been preparing his followers for his martyrdom for years and evangelizing to them the idea that any sanctioning of him is an attack on them. This transference of feelings of persecution and pain from manufactured victimhood is a classic psychological device of a cult leader. Trump uses the passions he has inflamed as a political threat against those pursuing him. In 2019, when he was facing impeachment, he took to Twitter, citing a quote from Pastor Robert Jeffress, who'd appeared on Fox News and recklessly posited that if Trump were removed from office, it will cause a civil war-like fracture in this nation from which this country will never heal. Last year, on a conservative talk radio show, Trump said that if he were indicted in connection with his alleged mishandling of classified documents, I think you'd have problems in this country the likes of which perhaps we've never seen before. I don't think the people of the United States would stand for it. Over and over, Trump has goaded his supporters in this direction, whether during the 2016 presidential race, urging rallygoers to knock the crap out of people who might disrupt the proceedings, or telling the Proud Boys, during a 2020 debate, to stand back and stand by. On January 6, 2021, he waited and watched the attack on the Capitol for hours, resisting pleas from his own advisors to try to stop it. When Trump finally made a statement, he downplayed the insurrection and reluctantly told the rioters to go home, but not without adding, we love you. You're very special. Trump is the impresario of incitement. Hell use any attempt to hold him accountable to agitate and activate his loyalists. That's not a reason to avoid vigorously and swiftly pursuing him legally, but rather a reason to do it. If we establish a precedent that amassing a significant threat to society is a ward against enforcement of the law, it makes a mockery of the law. It would reinforce what was already a persistent problem in the criminal justice system, unequal treatment of the rich and powerful, compared to that of the poor and powerless. A series of studies from more than a decade ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that upper-income people were more likely to lie cheat and literally take candy meant to be given to children. The researchers postulated that several factors could have contributed to this, including a lowered perception of risk, plenty of money to deal with the downstream costs of their behavior, feelings of entitlement, less concern about what other people think and a general sense that greed is good. At the same time, as Jeffrey Ryman and Paul Layton write in their book, The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, the criminal justice system is biased from start to finish in a way that guarantees that, for the same crimes, members of the lower classes are much more likely than members of the middle and upper classes to be arrested, convicted and imprisoned. The authors go further, theorizing that the goal of the criminal justice system isn't even to prevent crime or provide justice, 
but rather to a project to the American public a credible image of the threat of crime as a threat from the poor. When you think of it that way, it's not hard to see how Trump and many of his admirers choose to see him as above the law. Indeed, if he weren't rich and powerful, charges would almost surely have been filed long ago. Prosecuting Trump wouldn't break the country. On the contrary, it would be a step toward mending it, a step toward undergirding the flimsy promise of equal justice under law. The eyes of the country are on these cases, the eyes of all those who've been badgered for minor violations, who've had the book thrown at them for crimes that others either got away with or served no time for. Not only are they watching, but so are their loved ones and their communities. They, too, are America, and further damaging their faith in the country should matter as much as damaging the faith of any other part of our body politic. To rehabilitate American justice, Trump must be prosecuted. Over the past week, an observation by Matt Klein, a financial journalist, has gotten passed around quite a bit. This was more a case of a bank run by idiots rather than a bank run by idiots, he wrote, referring to the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. But why choose? Everyone involved in this looks terrible. Regulators did nothing, even though Silicon Valley Bank's woes had been widely noticed. Bank managers failed at the basic work of hedging against the risk of interest rates rising. Mid-sized banks, including Silicon Valley Bank itself, successfully lobbied Congress and the Trump administration to be exempted from the regulations attached to too big to fail banks. Venture capitalists sparked a needless panic that annihilated an institution central to their own industry. The Federal Reserve ignored inflation for too long, and the whiplash of its response has become a risk factor all its own. I don't think all these people, many of whom performed quite well before in crises and amid uncertainty, are, or suddenly became, idiots. Hey race a more generous interpretation, change makes fools of us all and we are living through an era of change. Three changes, in particular, are worth thinking about right now. Low interest rates came to an end. In his 2020 letter to investors, Seth Klarman, the chief executive and portfolio manager of the Bopost Group, a hedge fund, wrote, the idea of persistent low rates has wormed its way into everything, investor thinking, market forecasts, inflation expectations, valuation models, leverage ratios, debt ratings, affordability metrics, housing prices, and corporate behavior. He went on to say that by truncating downside volatility, forestalling business failures and postponing the day of reckoning, such policies have persuaded investors that risk has gone into hibernation or simply vanished. Point for Klarman Silicon Valley Bank's collapse is inseparable from the long era of low interest rates. Silicon Valley specialized in providing banking to startups that had little or no revenue but were nevertheless flush with cash, much of it coming, indirectly, from the Fed's huge increase in the money supply. Deposits at Silicon Valley Bank grew from $62 billion at the end of 2019 to $189 billion at the end of 2021. And the bank attempted to act conservatively. It squirreled that cash away in what was, in an era of low interest rates, understood as the safest, surest of investments, U.S. Treasuries and other long-term bonds. But as Adam Tooze, the financial historian, wrote, what that really meant was they were taking a huge $100 billion plus, one-way bet on interest rates. When interest rates rise, bond values fall. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered if Silicon Valley had hedged or diversified properly. But it didn't. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered if its customer base hadn't needed its money back, and quick. But it did. As interest rates rose, those same startups couldn't raise money as easily, and they needed to tap their cash. So Silicon Valley Bank was acutely exposed to interest rate hikes in both its deposits and its investments. 
to be fair, rate hikes were widely thought unlikely. Interest rates had, with a few exceptions, been on a downward trend for 40 years. Since 2009, they had often been near zero and negative when add just for inflation. In April 2021, Richard Clarita, who was then the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, said the conditions keeping rates low were a global phenomenon that is widely expected by forecasters and financial markets to persist for years to come. Less than a year later, the Fed would embark on one of its fastest rate hiking campaigns in history. As it did, all manner of assets that had levitated toward eye-popping valuations in recent years, stocks, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, Swiss watches, began to tumble. As Edward Chancellor writes in The Price of Time, a disconnect between finance and the real world lies at the heart of all great bubbles. The reason Silicon Valley banks' travails have led to a wider panic, one now engulfing banks with very different characteristics, like First Republic and Credit Suisse, is that Silicon Valley banks' circumstances might have been specific, but its problem generalizes. The financial economy we're in was built atop low interest rates. If you ask the question, who holds a lot of long term bonds and provides banking largely to tech startups in the Bay Area? Well, not many institutions fit the description. If you ask, instead, who planned for low interest rates to continue and may be vulnerable now that they're rising? There are many, many possible candidates. The dangers of viral finance made an appearance. John Maynard Keynes didn't have much patience for the myth of the rational market. Picking stocks, he wrote, was akin to a game in which the competitors have to pick out the six prettiest faces from 100 photographs, the prize being awarded to the competitor whose choice most nearly corresponds to the average preferences of the competitors as a whole, so that each competitor has to pick, not those faces that he himself finds prettiest, but those that he thinks likeliest to catch the fancy of the other competitors, all of whom are looking at the problem from the same point of view. His point was that in the short run, much of finance is about predicting what other people think. But one difference between our era and Keynes is that we have real-time, overwhelming access to what other people think. We do not have to imagine which faces our competitors consider the prettiest. They're talking about it, constantly, loudly, with their opinions ranked by likes and retweets all the time. There's been some debate about whether Silicon Valley Bank would have survived if a clatch of venture capitalists hadn't worked one another into a frenzy in various group chats. I'm not sure that's a useful question. You can't ban group chats, nor should you, to be clear. But digital information and digital banking mean bank runs can happen and spread to other institutions at astonishing speed. As Gillian Tett noted at the Financial Times, one remarkable detail about the SVB debacle is that, in a few hours last Thursday, about $42 billion, one quarter of S.V.B.S. deposits, left the institution, mostly through digital means. And it's not just bank runs. Everything from the fast rise and fall of crypto to the weird moment of meme stocks to the 2010 flash crash reflects the digital acceleration of finance. There is a question that has lurked on the edge of financial regulation for years now is, should we slow the system back down to a speed humans can work at? No one idea here would address all cases, a financial transaction tax would curb high-speed, algorithmic trading, but it wouldn't stop a bank run but it's worth wondering whether speed should be seen and addressed as a financial risk factor unto itself. Financial regulators turned out to be fighting the last war. In 2015, Greg Becker, the chief executive of Silicon Valley Bank, submitted testimony to the Senate Banking Committee arguing that the Dodd-Frank financial regulation rules should be loosened for banks like his. If they weren't, Becker warned, Silicon Valley Bank likely will need to divert significant resources from providing financing to job-creating companies in the innovation economy to complying with enhanced prudential standards and other requirements. If only.
but Becker's testimony is an interesting read for reasons other than grim irony. It is an argument about what makes a bank systemically important, the term of art for a financial institution that cannot be allowed to fail. It is an argument that persuaded the Trump administration, alongside nearly every congressional Republican and no small number of congressional Democrats. In his book The Money Problem, Morgan Ricks, a financial regulation expert at Vanderbilt Law School, writes that the problem here runs deep. Systemic risk, he says, has yet to be defined, let alone operationalized, in anything approaching a satisfactory way. Lawmakers had tried, in Dodd-Frank, to define it in terms of assets, $50 billion or above, and you posed a systemic risk. Becker, and top executives at many other mid-sized banks, argued that this cutoff was too low and too simplistic. You could not be a systemic risk, in their telling, unless you were a large bank attempting exotic financial engineering. SVB, like our mid-sized bank peers, does not present systemic risks, Becker said. We do not engage in market-making, securities underwriting, or other global investment banking activities. We also do not engage in complex derivatives transactions or dealing, offer complicated structured products or participate in other activities of the sort that contributed to the financial crisis. Put more simply, the idea here was that we know what a systemically risky bank looks like. It looks like the banks and assorted other financial institutions that caused the 2008 crash. This is a classic case of fighting the last war. But it is pervasive. As galling as it is that Silicon Valley Bank got itself exempted from being regulated as systemically important, it's not clear that regulators would have caught the bank's problems even if Dodd-Frank had remained untouched. As Joseph R. Mason and Chris James Michener noted, the Fed's 2022 stress tests didn't include interest rate risks. It, too, was fighting the last war. At the time of its detonation, Silicon Valley Bank had roughly $200 billion in assets. It was significant but not huge. As Becker said, it wasn't trading complex products or doing anything that looked like what sent the global economy into crisis in 2008. And yet regulators still declared it systemically important when it failed and backed up all its deposits. The government's definition of systemic importance, the one that is, even now, written into law, has been proved false. But this gets to a broader point. Banking is a critical form of public infrastructure that we pretend is a private act of risk management. The concept of systemic risk was meant to cordon off the quasi-public banks, the ones we would save, from the truly private banks that can be mostly left alone to manage their liabilities. But the lesson of the past 15 years is that there are no truly private banks, or at least we do not know, in advance, which those are. You might find it strange that a large segment of the Republican base thinks whites are the true victims of racism and that Christians are under attack. After all, America's biggest racial group is still whites, the most common religious affiliation remains Christianity. Whites and Christians dominate elected office at all levels, the judiciary, and corporate America. What's the problem? Well, there is a straightforward reason for the freakout, and an explanation for why former President Donald Trump developed such a close bond with white Christian nationalists. This group feels besieged because they are losing ground. The newly released 2022 supplement to the PRRI Census of American Religion, based on over 40,000 interviews conducted last year, confirms that the decline of white Christians, Americans who identify as white, non-Hispanic and Christian of any kind, as a proportion of the population continues unabated, writes Robert P. Jones, president of the Public Religion Research Institute. As recently as 2008, when our first black president was elected, the U.S. was a majority, 54%, white Christian country. 
By 2014 the number had dropped to 47 percent, and in 2022 it stood at 42 percent. The group that has declined the most is at the core of the mega movement, the group most devoted to Christian nationalism. White evangelical Protestants have experienced the steepest decline. As recently as 2006, white evangelical Protestants comprised nearly one quarter of Americans, 23 percent. By the time of Trump's rise to power, their numbers had dipped to 16.8 percent, Jones explains. Today, white evangelical Protestants comprise only 13.6 percent of Americans. And that decline may yet accelerate, because they skew older than the population as a whole. Put differently, there are far more baby boomers in this group than Generation Z members. White evangelicals are losing people with each successive generation. White Christian subgroups have each lost approximately half their market share just across the generations who are alive today, according to Jones. If your business had lost half its market share, you would be panicking, too. With those kind of numbers, the responsible thing to do would be to think about fixing what's wrong by adapting to a changing market. Instead, many in this cohort have doubled down, becoming the foot soldiers in the red-hatted mega movement. The decline isn't going to be reversed by angry, gray-haired folks demanding abortion bans and don't say gay bills. Instead, white evangelicals might look at former customers who are abandoning organized religion in droves. Nearly 4 in 10 Americans ages 18 to 29, 38%, are religiously unaffiliated, an increase from 34% in 2021, the PRRI census said. As the cohorts age, the growth in religiously unaffiliated Americans has started to show up more in the 30 to 49 age category, which is up to 32% unaffiliated from 26% in 2016. In some sense, white evangelicals' desperate efforts to cling to political power and demand adherence to a set of outdated cultural norms only make the problem worse. Not many 20 year olds, part of the most diverse, inclusive generation in history, one steeped in climate science and tech, would leap at the prospect of living in a state where abortion is unattainable, gays are ostracized and secularism is bashed. If Christian evangelicals really want to slow their decline, they might consider getting out of the unpopular political ideas market, example abortion bans, and stressing values that could win back alienated young people, example reverence for conserving the planet, ministering to the poor and the weak. That might put more seats in the pews, although it likely wouldn't do much for the aging, mostly white, reactionary GOP. The reality is that the convergence of the declining population of white Christians with the rise of Trump has been bad for both evangelicalism and American politics. Trump came along, telling the shrinking band of white Christian nationalists that they are victims. He reveled in nostalgia for a time when they dominated, demographically and politically, and blamed immigrants, elites, and wokeness for their ills. They were the group most susceptible to a message that reinforces their feeling they have lost something or something has been taken away. That something they felt had been stolen may have been as concrete as the 2020 election or as all-encompassing as white Christian supremacy. However they define that sense of loss, it fuels their anger and binds them to Trump. But the demographic clock cannot be turned back. No one can claim to be patriotic defenders of democracy when they decide their declining numbers justify anti-democratic voter suppression or even violence. In short, mega-white Christians have painted themselves into a corner where the majority rejects their outlook and anti-majoritarian tactics cannot keep them in power forever. A dramatic transformation would need to happen for this movement to return to pluralistic politics. The mega crowd would have to recognize America's complete history, reflecting our full experience, not just the story of people like them. And most important, they would need to rediscover the principles on which the United States was founded. All men are created equal. 
They would have to abandon the myth that America is the domain of one race or religion. Unimaginable. Maybe so, but what other choice is there? To thrive in the future, they eventually must appeal to America as it is, not as they imagine it was in the past. Conventional economic wisdom says that it's costly and inefficient to spend a lot of money fixing a problem before the necessary technology has matured. By that logic, the environmental pluses from quickly stopping climate change have to be weighed against the economic minus of higher costs. But a study published last year in the scientific journal Joule lays out a more encouraging case. The peer-reviewed article, Empirically Grounded Technology Forecasts and the Energy Transition, says that, in a faster transition, we are likely to reach lower costs sooner. The fast transition is defined as eliminating fossil fuels by around 2050. The key to the savings is that one learns by doing, as anyone who tries to hang wallpaper or make a crepe for the first time will confirm. The authors invoke Wright's Law which is not a hard and fast law but more of an observation that was made in a 1936 paper by the engineer Theodore P. Wright, who said that costs fall as production experience grows. The authors are Rupert Way, Matthew C., Ives, Penny Mealy and J. Doinfarmer, all of whom are affiliated with the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School. The first three authors are also at the University of Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Farmer is also at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. They focus on four green technologies, solar power, wind power, battery storage, and P2X electrolysis. That last one is short for power to X, where X represents a synthetic fuel. The idea of P2X is to use renewably generated electricity, the power, to electrolyze water, releasing hydrogen, and then either burn the hydrogen or combine the hydrogen with something else to make a fuel, the X. Combining it with nitrogen yields ammonia. Combining it with carbon dioxide makes a hydrocarbon fuel. This is carbon neutral because the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced by combustion of a synthetic fuel roughly equals the amount of carbon dioxide that was captured to make the fuel. In rough numbers, the costs of solar photovoltaics, wind turbines and batteries, which store the electricity generated by solar and wind, have been dropping at a rate of nearly 10% a year for several decades, the authors write. P2X electrolysis is newer but is also getting cheaper rapidly, they add. In contrast, they write, there's less room for reduction in the cost of fossil fuels because the technology is already well advanced and the resources are becoming harder to find. High-tech technologies tend to get cheaper because of ever-increasing knowledge accumulation. Comparatively lower-tech technologies can't get much cheaper because we've accumulated all the knowledge we can already, Way wrote in a follow-up email. While Wright's law posits that cumulative production causes prices to drop, because people learn by doing, an alternate hypothesis is that the causality runs in the other direction, prices drop, so production increases. In the case of tank production in World War II, the causality clearly ran from higher production to lower costs, according to a 2020 paper by Farmer and two other authors. The Jewel paper paraphrases the 2021, Roosevelt did not say, tanks are getting cheaper, let's build more, but rather ordered the production of as many tanks as were needed to win the war. In most cases, the Jewel paper concludes, the causality runs both directions, there is a virtuous cycle, in which increasing production causes lower costs and lower costs cause increasing demand, which increases production. Wei said that the paper has been well received in policymaking and industry circles but faced some resistance on its journey to publication from technical experts on various kinds of energy. The more expert you are at something, the more able you are to see the hurdles, he said they always err on the slower side. It adds up subtly in a way you don't comprehend to an overall pessimism. It's certainly true and documented in the Jewel paper that technical experts have repeatedly underestimated the pace of cost reductions and deployment of solar and wind technology. That could be a sign that Wright's law is real and underappreciated.
If so, then pushing to increase the output of green technologies faster could have big payoffs for budgets as well as the planet. Donald Trump has long possessed a singular talent for humiliating my Kevin, as Trump calls House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, and now he has done it again. Late Sunday, McCarthy told reporters that Trump supporters should not protest if Trump is indicted, as expected. The California Republican added, I think President Trump, if you talk to him, he doesn't believe that either. Someone should tell that to President Trump. A few hours after McCarthy issued his plea, Trump unleashed a tirade on Truth Social that effectively cast any indictment as a war on mega nation waged by the radical left and the communists, Marxists, rhinos, and losers. This functionally reiterated his previous call for civil unrest. This moment vindicates those who long insisted the GOP must hold Trump accountable for the insurrection on January 6, 2021, if only to send a signal to GOP voters. Republicans instead squandered years of opportunities to categorically side with law enforcement and for the proposition that violence and lawlessness have no place in our politics because those stances might put them crosswise of mega. Now, with Trump possibly facing indictment in Manhattan over hush money payments to porn actress Stormy Daniels during the 2016 campaign, his advisors are publicly demanding that leading Republicans stand behind him. Trump World reportedly believes this will be problematic for presumed 2024 rivals such as Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who are trying to win support among mega Republicans while also appealing to party elites who want to move past Trump. Asked about this Monday, DeSantis tried to have it both ways, going out of his way to draw attention to the seamy nature of the case. Look, I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star while blaming the possible indictment on George Soros. Non-mega hopefuls have also struggled with their responses. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has remained quiet, while former Vice President Mike Pence, who has denounced Trump over January 6th, blamed the situation on the radical left. Republican leaders themselves are to blame for this quandary. That's because GOP lawmakers and influencers have, for six years, dismissed legitimate probes of grave crimes against the country into very real Russian interference in the 2016 election, into Trump's extraordinary assault on U.S. constitutional democracy, into his hoarding of state secrets as a witch hunt perpetrated by the deep state. Just after January 6th, Genuine constitutional conservatives and scholars of democratic breakdown alike warned that the conduct of GOP leaders would be critical in determining whether rank-and-file Republican voters accepted the need to hold Trump accountable to preserve the rule of law. Political science holds that elite signaling sends important cues to voters on how to understand politics. And sure enough, Polling now shows that an overwhelming majority of GOP voters still believe Trump was the wrong party in 2020. Trump and elected Republican leaders have trained their base to think of any law enforcement activity that looks into Trump as a witch hunt. Natalie Jackson, who closely monitors polling of GOP voters as the director of research at the Public Religion Research Institute, told me, When we get to a possible indictment now, it's just seen as more of the same. To be fair, legal experts see a lot of potential problems and complexities involved in an indictment of Trump for allegedly committing bookkeeping fraud or breaking campaign finance laws by covering up a hush money payment. There isn't anything wrong in principle with criticizing an indictment on substantive grounds. But that's not what McCarthy and other Republicans are doing. McCarthy did dismiss an indictment as the weakest case that could be brought against Trump. But he went much further, slamming it in advance as a political prosecution. Pence, who, again, is casting himself as non-mega, did the same. Can anyone really deny that Republicans will do this no matter what Trump is indicted for? Republicans are now seemingly required to cast any and all law enforcement activity directed at Trump as inherently illegitimate. 
At the same time, McCarthy knows it's politically lethal for his party to be associated with outbreaks of mega lawlessness or violence. So he's calling for calm in response to any indictment, while simultaneously endorsing Trump's claim that it can only be the result of a witch hunt against him. That straddle is absurd and unsustainable. To paraphrase a great poet of responsibility and regret, if Republicans are now potentially stuck with a leading candidate for the 2024 nomination who is facing a criminal indictment, one they can't even cite to persuade GOP voters it's time to move on, it's their own damn fault. I'm on vacation and trying to spend a few weeks not thinking about the usual stuff. But it turns out that I can't stay completely out of the debate over the sudden wave of banking crises and their effect on the economic outlook. So as everyone knows, Silicon Valley Bank, not a huge institution, but an integral part of the tech industry's financial ecosystem, has been taken over by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation after facing a classic bank run. Signature Bank soon followed, First Republic Bank is under severe pressure. Swiss authorities have arranged a takeover of Credit Suisse, a major bank, by its rival UBS. And everyone is wondering what other landmines may be about to go off. There will and should be many inquests into how and why these banks managed to get into so much trouble. In the case of SVB it appears that regulators had known for some time that the bank was a problem case, but for some reason didn't or couldn't rein it in. But the more pressing question is forward-looking. How much does the banking mess change economic conditions? How much should it change economic policy? Some commentators, mainly, as far as I can tell, cryptocurrency enthusiasts, are issuing apocalyptic warnings about hyperinflation and the imminent collapse of the dollar. But that's almost certainly the opposite of the truth. When depositors pull their money out of banks, the effect is disinflationary, even deflationary. That's certainly what happened in the early years of the Great Depression. The savings and loan crisis of the 1980s wasn't a depression-level event, largely because depositors were generally insured, so they were made whole, at taxpayers' immense expense, despite huge industry losses. Even so, the crisis may have curbed business lending, especially in the commercial real estate industry, contributing to the 1990-91 recession. And the financial crisis of 2008, which was functionally a bank run even though the crisis centered on shadow banks rather than traditional depository institutions, was also disinflationary and helped bring on the worst economic slump since the Great Depression. So how does the current mess compare? It will definitely impose a drag on the economy. But how big a drag? And how much should it change policy, in particular the interest rate decisions of the Federal Reserve? The answer is simple, nobody knows. Hey race what we do know, depositors don't seem to be demanding cash and putting it under their mattresses. They are, however, moving funds out of small and medium-sized banks, to some extent into big banks, and to some extent into money market funds. Both types of institution are likely to do less business lending than the smaller banks now under pressure. Big banks are more tightly regulated than smaller banks, required to have more capital, the excess of assets over liabilities, and more liquidity, a higher proportion of their assets devoted to investments that can readily be converted into cash. Money market funds also face quite stringent liquidity requirements. Add in the likelihood that even banks that haven't experienced a run on their deposits will become much more cautious, and we're probably looking at a serious reduction in credit. In effect, banking turmoil will act a lot like a rate hike by the Fed. But how big an effective rate hike? I'm seeing smart, well-informed people produce numbers that are all over the place. Goldman Sachs says well see the equivalent of a rate hike of 0.25 to 0.5 percentage points, Torsten Slock of Apollo Global Management says 1.5 percentage points. I have no idea who's right. However, the direction of the shock seems clear. 
I wrote a couple of weeks ago that the Fed is creeping its way through a dense data fog, trying to steer between the scylla of inflation if it tightens too little and the charybdis of recession if it tightens too much, or maybe it's the other way around. Input from Homer scholars is welcome. Well, the fog has gotten even thicker. But clearly the risk of recession has gone up and the risk of inflation has gone down. So it makes sense for the Fed to steer somewhat to the left. What this probably means in practice is that the Fed should pause its rate hikes until there's more clarity about both the inflation picture and the effects of the banking mess, and it should be clear that that's what it is doing. There doesn't seem to be much danger that the Fed will lose its inflation-fighting credibility if it takes time to get its bearings. Inflation expectations are looking very well anchored. Should the Fed go further and actually cut rates? Even though I'm generally a monetary dove, I wouldn't call for an actual cut, at least just yet. Among other things, that might convey a sense of panic. And even though the wave of bank problems has shocked almost everyone, panic doesn't seem like the right response. On the other hand, for the Fed to continue with rate hikes right now might send the opposite signal, a sense of cluelessness. This seems like a time to say, don't just do something, stand there. For what it's worth, and these may be famous last words, I'm actually somewhat reassured by the way policymakers have been responding to the current wave of banking problems. Some of us remember bitter debates in 2008 to 2009 about how to stabilize the financial system, the troubled institutions were complex and opaque and nobody in power seemed willing to seize them so that they could be rescued without also bailing out shareholders. This time we're talking about conventional banks that can be and have been seized by the FDIC, protecting depositors without letting shareholders off the hook. The upshot is that so far, at least, this doesn't look like a full-blown financial crisis. Stay tuned, though. If you intend to indict and try a former president of the United States, especially a former president of the United States whose career has benefited from the collapse of public trust in the neutrality of all our institutions, you had better have clear evidence, all but obvious guilt and loads of legal precedent behind your case. The case that New York prosecutors are apparently considering bringing against Donald Trump, over hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels that may have violated campaign finance laws, does not have the look of a slam dunk. The use of the phrase, novel legal theory in descriptions of what the case might entail is not encouraging. Neither are the doubts raised by writers and pundits not known for their sympathy to Trump. Or the fact that we have a precedent of a presidential candidate indicted over a remarkably similar offense, the trial of John Edwards for his payments to Riel Hunter, that yielded an acquittal on one count and a hung jury on the rest. The Bill Clinton Monica Lewinsky precedent is a little less legally relevant, involving per jury rather than campaign finance law. But the Clinton scandals established a general principle that presidents are above the law as long as the lawbreaking involved minor infractions covering up tawdry sex. If a potential Trump prosecution requires overturning that principle, then prosecutors might as well appear in court wearing Democratic Party campaign paraphernalia, the effect will be the same. That effect does not need to benefit Trump politically to make such a prosecution unwise or reckless. An indictment could hurt him at the polls and still be a very bad long-term idea, setting a precedent that will pressure Republican prosecutors to indict Democratic politicians on similarly doubtful charges, establish a pattern of legal revenge seeking against the out-of-power party and encourage polarization's continued transformation into enmity. But of course, the political question is inescapable. Will an indictment help Trump or hurt him in his quest to reclaim the Republican nomination and the presidency? Two generalizations are relatively easy to make. Even a partisan-seeming indictment won't do anything to make Trump more popular with the independent voters who swing presidential elections, it will just be added baggage for a politician already widely regarded as chaotic and immoral and unfit for the office. 
at the same time, even an airtight indictment would be regarded as persecution by Trump's most devoted fans. So whether or not there's a wave of mega-protests now, you would expect the spectacle of a prosecution to help mobilize and motivate his base in 2024. Alexander Burns of Politico argues that these two points together are a net negative for Trump. After all, he doesn't need to mobilize his base. They will mostly be there for him, no matter what, he needs to persuade the doubtful and exhausted that he's their man in 2024. And if even a few of these voters get weary of another round of Stormy Daniel Slees, then he's worse off. Burns writes, if each scandal or blunder binds 99% of his base closer to him and unsettles 1%, that is still a losing formula for a politician whose base is an electoral minority. Trump cannot shed fractional support with every controversy but make it up on volume. I'm not sure it's quite that simple. That's because in addition to the true base voter, who will be with Trump in any case, and the true swing voter, who probably pulled the lever for Joe Biden last time, there's the Republican primary swing voter, the voter who's part of Trump's base for general election purposes but doesn't love him absolutely, the voter who's open to Ron DeSantis but swings between the two Florida Republicans, depending on the headlines at the moment. I can tell you two stories about how this kind of voter reacts to an indictment. In one, Trump does well with this constituency when he's either out of the news or on the offensive and does worse when he seems weakened, messy, a loser. Hence the DeSantis bump in polling immediately after the 2022 midterms, when the underperformance of Trump's favored candidates damaged his mystique and his flailing afterward made him look impotent. Hence his apparent recovery in polling more recently, as he's taken the fight to DeSantis without the Florida governor striking back, making Trump look stronger than his not-yet-campaigning rival. Under this theory, even a politicized and partisan indictment returns Trump to a flailing position, making him seem like a victim rather than a master of events, a stumbling loser caught in liberal nets. So the Republican swing voter behaves like the general election swing voter and recoils, and the disciplined DeSantis benefits. But there's an alternative story in which our Republican swing voter is invested not in specific candidates so much as in the grand battle with the liberal political establishment. In this theory the DeSantis brand is built on his being a battler, a scourge of cultural liberalism in all its forms, while Trump has lost ground by appearing more interested in battling his fellow Republicans, even to the point of hurting the GOP cause and helping liberals win. What happens, though? when institutional liberalism seems to take the fight to Trump? Yes, I know a single prosecutor isn't institutional liberalism, but that's how this will be perceived. When the grand ideological battle is suddenly joined around his person, his position, his very freedom? Well, maybe that seems like confirmation of the argument that certain Trumpists have been making for a while, that there's nothing the establishment fears more than a Trump restoration, that, they can't let him back in, as the former Trump White House official Michael Anton put it last year. And so if you care most about ideological conflict, it doesn't matter if you don't love him as his true supporters do, where Trump stands, there you must stand as well. This is the rally to Trump effect that seems most imaginable if an indictment comes, not a burst of zeal for the man himself but a repetition of the enemy of my enemy dynamic that's been crucial to his resilience all along. Of course, since at least some Democrats would be happy to see Trump rather than DeSantis as the nominee, you could argue that in this scenario the spoiling for a fight conservatives would be essentially letting themselves be manipulated into fighting on the wrong battlefield, for the wrong leader, with the wrong stakes but persuading them of that will fall to DeSantis himself, whose own campaign will make one of these two narratives of Republican psychology look prophetic, the first in victory, the second in defeat. Various books I've been reading lately have me thinking about 1966. I have often said that the history of black America could be divided between what happened before and after that year. 
It was a year when the fight for black equality shifted sharply in mood, ushering in an era in which rhetoric overtook actual game plans for action. It planted the seed for the excesses of today's wokeness. I wouldn't have been on board, and am glad I was only a baby that year and didn't have to face it as a mature person. The difference between Black America in 1960 and in 1970 appears vaster to me than it was between the start and end of any other decade since the 1860s, after emancipation. And in 1966 specifically, Stokely Carmichael made his iconic speech about a separatist Black power, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee he led expelled its white members, though Carmichael himself did not advocate this. The Black Panther Party was born, Black replaced Negro as the preferred term, the Afro went mainstream, and Malcolm X's The Autobiography of Malcolm X, written with Alex Haley, became a standard text for Black readers. I doubt most people living through that year thought of it as a particularly unique 365 days, but Mark Whitaker, a former editor of Newsweek, has justified my sense of that year as seminal with his new book, Saying It Loud. 1966, the year black power challenged the civil rights movement. Whitaker has a journalist's understanding of the difference between merely documenting the facts and using them to tell a story, and his sober yet crisp prose pulls the reader along with nary a lull. But one question keeps nagging at me, why did the mood shift at that particular point? The conditions of black America at the time would not have led one to imagine that a revolution in thought was imminent. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 had just happened. The economy was relatively strong, and black men in particular were now earning twice or more what they earned before World War II. As the political scientist and historian duo Abigail and Stefan Thernstrom noted in their book America in Black and White, before World War II, black bank tellers, bookkeepers, cashiers, secretaries, stenographers, telephone operators or mail carriers were rare. By 1970 they were very common, though far more in the North than in the South. And as to claims one might hear that black America was uniquely fed up in 1966, were black people not plenty fed up in 1876, or after World War I or World War II? What Whitaker so deftly chronicles strikes me less as a natural development from on-the-ground circumstances than as something more elusive for the historian, the emergence and influence of that mood shift I referred to. Carmichael memorably said, the only way we gonna stop them white men from whooping us is to take over. We been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we gonna start saying now is black power. The dramatic impact was obvious. But what did black power mean, and how much change on the ground did this kind of rhetoric ever actually result in? What were Carmichael's concrete plans for action in the first place? There was always a certain performative element in the man, not for nothing was he referred to as Starmichael. Whitaker recounts Carmichael's proposing having Harlem send one million black men up to invade Scarsdale, but really? The NAACP head Roy Wilkins was infuriated at a crucial summit meeting between leading black groups where Carmichael referred to Lyndon Johnson as that cat, the president, and recommended publicly denouncing his work. This was a key conflict between an older style seeking to work within the only reality available and a new style favoring a kind of utopian agitprop. Figures like Carmichael and Black Panther's Huey Newton, Eldridge Cleaver and H. Rap Brown fascinate from a distance, with their implacable fierceness and true black pride shocking a complacent leave-it-to-beaver America. Plus their fashion sense, the berets, the leather jackets, was hard not to like. It all made for great photos and good television. But at the time, affirmative action and the Fair Housing Act of 1968, supported by those white cats responding to the suasion of people like Wilkins and Martin Luther King Jr., were making a real difference in black lives, central to encouraging the growth of the black middle class. This difference between mood and action is relevant to the historian Beverly Gage's magnificent new biography, G-Man. 
J. Edgar Hoover and the Making of the American Century. The book's 800-plus pages are so Karoesque in detail, context and narrative energy that I have dragged the hardback across the Atlantic and back. Gage somehow makes a page-turner out of the life of a man with the stage presence of a toad. Where Hoover comes in on the 1966 issue is a common observation of his, which was that the black-led urban riots of the long, hot summer, and the general change in mood from integrationist to separatist, was not solely a response to the frustrations of poverty. Of course, Hoover couldn't get much further than seeing black people as having simply given in to a general anti-establishment degeneracy, egged on by communist influence. That was one part nonsense, the communist one, and one part racism. Hoover was bred in a southern city, D.C., at the turn of the 20th century, post Plessy v. Ferguson. He came of age embraced by a fraternity steeped in post-Reconstruction lost cause ideology about black people. His late career persecution of the Panthers with FBI technology and tactics was nastier and more reckless with people's lives than his earlier witch hunt against white communists had been. Yet, his sense that the new developments were not caused by socioeconomics was not entirely mistaken. Rather, I suspect that much of why leading black political ideology took such a menacing, and even impractical, turn in the late 1960s was that white America was by that time poised to hear it out. Not all of white America. But a critical mass had become aware, through television and the passage of bills like the Civil Rights Act, that there was a race issue requiring attention. It's a safe bet that if black leaders had taken the tone of Carmichael and the Panthers in 1900 or even 1950, the response from whites would have been openly violent and even murderous. The theatricality of the new message was in part a response to enough whites now being interested in listening. The problem was that so much of the message, at that point, was a kind of kabuki, as the black essayist Deborah Dickerson memorably put it a while ago. Savory, dramatic poses were often more important than plans. This was perhaps a natural result of the fact that the remaining problems were challenging to address. With legalized segregation, disenfranchisement and residential balkanization now illegal, the question was what to do next and how. Black power did not turn out to be the real answer. It all burned out early, Whitaker identifies signs that this would happen as soon as the end of 1966. Daniel Axt's lucid group biography, War by Other Means, The Pacifists of the Greatest Generation Who Revolutionized Resistance, demonstrates people of the era engaging in action that brings about actual change. Following the lives and careers of the activists Dorothy Day, Dwight MacDonald, David Dellinger and Bayad Rustin, one senses almost none of the detour into showmanship that so infused 1966. While Carmichael made speeches that, to many, were suggestive of violence, and later moved to Africa, Rustin, for example, essentially birthed the March on Washington. I hardly intend that Carmichael's brand of progressivism has only been known among black people. Today it has attained cross-racial influence, serving as a model for today's extremes of wokeness, confusing acting out for action. One might suppose that the acting out is at least a demonstration of leftist philosophy, perhaps valuable as a teaching tool of sorts. But is it? The flinty, readable left is not woke by Susan Neiman, the director of the Einstein Forum think tank, explores that question usefully. Neiman limbs the new wokeness as an anti-enlightenment program, despite its humanistic Latinate vocabulary. She associates true leftism with a philosophy that asserts a commitment to universalism over tribalism, a firm distinction between justice and power and a belief in the possibility of progress and sees little of those elements in the essentializing, punitive and pessimistic tenets too common in modern wokeness. Woke begins with concern for marginalized persons, and ends by reducing each to the prism of her marginalization, she writes. In the focus on inequalities of power, the concept of justice is often left by the wayside. 
Woke demands that nations and peoples face up to their criminal histories. In the process it often concludes that all history is criminal. Neiman critiques pioneering texts of this kind of view, such as Michel Foucault's widely assigned book, Discipline and Punish, in his essay What is Enlightenment, in which he scorns introducing dialectical nuances while seeking to determine what good and bad elements there may have been in the Enlightenment. In this cynical and extremist kind of rhetoric, Neiman notes that you may look for an argument, what you'll find is contempt. And the problem, she adds, is that those who have learned in college to distrust every claim to truth will hesitate to acknowledge falsehood. All of these books relate to a general sense I have always had, that in 1966 something went seriously awry with what used to be called the struggle. There is a natural human tendency in which action devolves into gesture, the concrete drifts into abstraction, the outline morphs into shorthand. It's true in language, in the arts, and in politics, and I think its effects distracted much black American thought, as today's wokeness as performance also leads us astray, at a time when there was finally the opportunity to do so much more. I will explore what that more was in another column. But in the meantime, Whitaker, Neiman, Axton, albeit more obliquely, Gage are useful in showing why 1966 was such an important turning point in the story. I had a most remarkable but unsettling experience last week. Craig Mundy, the former Chief Research and Strategy Officer for Microsoft, was giving me a demonstration of GPT-4, the most advanced version of the artificial intelligence chatbot ChatGPT, developed by OpenAI and launched in November. Craig was preparing to brief the board of my wife's museum, Planet Word, of which he is a member, about the effect ChatGPT will have on words, language, and innovation. You need to understand, Craig warned me before he started his demo, this is going to change everything about how we do everything. I think that it represents mankind's greatest invention to date. It is qualitatively different, and it will be transformational. Large language modules like ChatGPT will steadily increase in their capabilities, Craig added, and take us toward a form of artificial general intelligence, delivering efficiencies in operations, ideas, discoveries and insights that have never been attainable before across every domain. Then he did a demonstration. And I realized Craig's words were an understatement. First, he asked GPT-4, for which Craig was a selected advanced tester and which was just released to the public, to summarize Planet Word and its mission in 400 words. It did so perfectly in a few seconds. Then he asked it to do the same in 200 words. Another few seconds. Then he asked it to do the same in Arabic. Just as quickly. Then in Mandarin. Two more seconds. Then in English again, but in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. A few more seconds. Then Craig asked GPT-4 to write the same description in an ABCDarian verse, where the first line begins with the letter A, the second with B, and so on through the alphabet. It did it with stunning creativity, beginning, and so on, through Z. I could barely sleep that night. To observe an AI system, its software, microchips, and connectivity produce that level of originality in multiple languages in just seconds each time, well, the first thing that came to mind was the observation by the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The second thing that came to mind was a moment at the start of The Wizard of Oz, the tornado scene where everything and everyone are lifted into a swirling gyre, including Dorothy and Toto, and then swept away from mundane, black and white Kansas to the gleaming futuristic land of Oz, where everything is in color. We are about to be hit by such a tornado. This is a Promethean moment we've entered, one of those moments in history when certain new tools, ways of thinking or energy sources are introduced that are such a departure and advance on what existed before that you can't just change one thing, 
you have to change everything. That is, how you create, how you compete, how you collaborate, how you work, how you learn, how you govern and, yes, how you cheat, commit crimes and fight wars. We know the key Promethean eras of the last 600 years, the invention of the printing press, the scientific revolution, the agricultural revolution combined with the industrial revolution, the nuclear power revolution, personal computing and the internet and now this moment. Only this Promethean moment is not driven by a single invention, like a printing press or a steam engine, but rather by a technology supercycle. It is our ability to sense, digitize, process, learn, share and act, all increasingly with the help of AI. That loop is being put into everything, from your car to your fridge to your smartphone to fighter jets, and it's driving more and more processes every day. It's why I call our Promethean era the age of acceleration, amplification, and democratization. Never have more humans had access to more cheap tools that amplify their power at a steadily accelerating rate while being diffused into the personal and working lives of more and more people all at once. And it's happening faster than most anyone anticipated. The potential to use these tools to solve seemingly impossible problems, from human biology to fusion energy to climate change, is awe-inspiring. Consider just one example that most people probably haven't even heard of, the way DeepMind, an AI lab owned by Google parent Alphabet, recently used its AlphaFold AI system to solve one of the most wicked problems in science at a speed and scope that was stunning to the scientists who had spent their careers slowly, painstakingly creeping closer to a solution. The problem is known as protein folding. Proteins are large complex molecules made up of strings of amino acids. And as my Times colleague Cade Metz explained in a story on AlphaFold, proteins are the microscopic mechanisms that drive the behavior of the human body and all other living things. What each protein can do, though, largely depends on its unique three-dimensional structure. Once scientists can identify the shapes of proteins, added METs, they can accelerate the ability to understand diseases, create new medicines, and otherwise probe the mysteries of life on Earth. But, Science News noted, it has taken decades of slow-going experiments to reveal the structure of more than 194,000 proteins, all housed in the protein data bank. In 2022, though, the AlphaFold database exploded with predicted structures for more than 200 million proteins. For a human that would be worthy of a Nobel Prize. Maybe two. And with that our understanding of the human body took a giant leap forward. As a 2021 scientific paper, Unfolding AI's Potential, published by the Bipartisan Policy Center, put it, AlphaFold is a meta-technology, meta-technologies have the capacity to help find patterns that aid discoveries in virtually every discipline. ChatGPT is another such meta-technology. But as Dorothy discovered when she was suddenly transported to Oz, there was a good witch and a bad witch there, both struggling for her soul. So it will be with the likes of ChatGPT, Google's Bard, and AlphaFold. Are we ready? It's not looking that way. We're debating whether to ban books at the dawn of a technology that can summarize or answer questions about virtually every book for everyone everywhere in a second. Like so many modern digital technologies based on software and chips, at I is dual use, it can be a tool or a weapon. The last time we invented a technology this powerful we created nuclear energy, it could be used to light up your whole country or obliterate the whole planet. But the thing about nuclear energy is that it was developed by governments, which collectively created a system of controls to curb its proliferation to bad actors, not perfectly but not bad. AI, by contrast, is being pioneered by private companies for profit. The question we have to ask, Craig argued, is how do we govern a country, and a world, where these AI technologies can be weapons or tools in every domain, while they are controlled by private companies and are accelerating in power every day? 
and do it in a way that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We are going to need to develop what I call complex adaptive coalitions, where business, government, social entrepreneurs, educators, competing superpowers, and moral philosophers all come together to define how we get the best and cushion the worst of AI. No one player in this coalition can fix the problem alone. It requires a very different governing model from traditional left-right politics. And we will have to transition to it amid the worst great power tensions since the end of the Cold War and culture wars breaking out inside virtually every democracy. We better figure this out fast because, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. House Republicans have given Oversight a bad name. Oversight should not be about baseless fishing expeditions, example, political pressure on Twitter, political payback, example, Hunter Biden, or obstruction of the Justice Department or local prosecutors, for instance, wholly overstepping congressional authority and violating states' policing authority in harassing Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. For starters, oversight hearings must have a legitimate legislative purpose. Done properly, an information gathering and public education process can provide the basis for thoughtful legislation. But when it comes to necessary oversight, Senate Democrats have done precious little despite an array of topics crying out for congressional investigation. Abortion. Return to menu. The Supreme Court decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization has triggered a slew of abortion bans, with devastating consequences for women and their families. The lawsuit filed in Texas by five women and two doctors documents the danger and suffering the state's abortion ban has inflicted on women, the dire consequences for women who need appropriate care for miscarriages, and the impact on the medical profession. A new report from the National Center for Health Statistics documents that even before Dobbs, the United States' already high maternal death rate was rising, 32.9 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2021 compared with 23.8 in 2020 and 20.1 in 2019, especially for black women, 2.6 times that of white women. After Dobbs, that figure can be expected to soar. Where are the Senate hearings on this health crisis? Senators should bring in a variety of healthcare specialists, hospital officials, medical ethicists, women, families of female victims, sociologists, and statisticians to highlight the economic, emotional, and family impact when women are forced to give birth against their will, and legal scholars to, among other things, explain the inherent vagueness and unworkability of state statutes. Senate Republicans who have cheered these bans should see evidence of the harm they support. Hearings would serve an array of critical legislative purposes, to secure abortion access, despite the House's forced birth fanaticism, protect women's right to travel to secure critical care, enact appropriate policy for military and federal civilian personnel, or appropriate funding for further study. Foreign Corruption and Influence Peddling Return to menu. Simply because there is no legislative justification for investigating Hunter Biden does not mean that the Senate should ignore instances in which presidential relatives in White House positions might have personally benefited from self-dealing with foreign powers. The Post's Michael Cranish reported in February, in an interview for that piece, former President Donald Trump's national security adviser John Bolton asked, why should Jared be worried about the Middle East? It's a perfectly logical inference. That had something to do with business. He sounds like the perfect witness to kick off a set of robust hearings. Before the House changed hands, Democrats on the House Oversight Committee had begun an inquiry. Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat Oregon, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, has vowed to follow the money. But perhaps the Senate should kick this up a notch and form a select committee on foreign corruption and influence peddling. At issue would not be simply Kushner's conflicts of interest, 
and the need for strict anti-nepotism laws, but the practice of former U.S. military officials consulting with the Saudis and other governments, the need to clarify and update the Foreign Agents Registration Act, example, if an outfit isn't a news organization, should it have to register if it's a mouthpiece for a foreign government's propaganda? The reporting requirements for all campaigns that have contact with representatives of a foreign government, a measure that should have been passed after the Mueller report documented multiple contacts between the Trump 2016 campaign and Russian officials. And, while they are at it, what happened to the need to pass legislation to enforce the Foreign Emoluments Clause? Systemic Racism in Policing Return to Menu the Justice Department recently announced the findings of a horrifying report into the pattern and practice of civil rights abuses in the Louisville Police Department. The New York Times reported on the use of excessive force, searches based on invalid and so-called no-knock warrants, unlawful car stops, detentions and harassment of people during street sweeps, and broad patterns of discrimination against black people and those with behavioral health problems. Justice separately announced it would add the Memphis Police Department's special units, implicated in the killing of Tyre Nichols, to the list of police departments it is investigating, example, Minneapolis, New York, Oklahoma City, Phoenix, Mount Vernon, New York, Worcester, Massachusetts, and the Louisiana State Police. Republicans continue to deny there is such a thing as systemic racism. Well, let's have a series of hearings to get to the bottom of this. Before racing to the inevitable standoff over police reform, which faltered after the murder of George Floyd, maybe some education for the public and for bury their head in the sand lawmakers is warranted. Let's hear from the Justice Department, crime statisticians, local police departments that have successfully reduced police abuse, community groups and victims' families. It seems that rather than engage in a useless back and forth with mega Republicans who refuse to acknowledge that white people are not the biggest victims of racism, Democrats would do well to put the facts on the table for all to see. After Floyd's murder, they should have more faith in Americans' ability to absorb disagreeable facts, confront systemic racism and demand real change. But that likely won't happen without a broad effort to enlighten lawmakers and voters. Perhaps I am a cockeyed optimist, but recent investigative efforts, from the January 6, 2021, hearings to the Ukraine war, suggest facts do matter. Hearings, properly undertaken with an eye toward public consumption, can set out a persuasive public record. At the very least, Senate Democrats should force Republicans to confront reality and the lies they tell themselves and their followers. If and when Donald Trump faces criminal charges, it will thrust the country into a new type of political war over an unprecedented situation, and Republicans are already rising to the occasion. They're signaling a willingness to deploy the full levers of their power in sordid but novel ways to paint any prosecution as the stuff of banana republics. Democrats will have to marshal some serious creativity in response. The extraordinary move by House Republicans to insert themselves into Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's investigation of Trump provides Democrats with an opening to do just that. This week, Representative Jim Jordan, Republican Ohio, and other top Republicans sent a letter to Bragg demanding documents and testimony related to expectations that Bragg might charge Trump over a hush money payment to a porn actress in 2016. The letter declared this an unprecedented abuse of prosecutorial authority, even though no charges have been filed. But it's not clear that Jordan, the Judiciary Committee chair, has thought this through. The course of action signaled by the letter, also signed by Oversight Committee Chair James Comer, Republican Kentucky, could go sideways for Republicans in unforeseen ways. Alexandra Petrie, but could this be good news for Trump? 
Democrats are examining whether a protracted struggle over the GOP demands of Bragg could allow them to shed light on the highly irregular nature of this GOP interference. This is an extreme move to use the resources of Congress to interfere with a criminal investigation at the state and local level and block an indictment, Representative Jamie Raskin, M.D., the ranking Democrat on the Oversight Committee, told me. He likened the aggressive GOP enforcement of absolute impunity for Trump to the kind of political culture you find in authoritarian dictatorships. Republicans treat it as a given that whatever charges are filed will be illegitimate. True, some legal experts see serious complications in the case. But as New York University law professors Brian Goodman and Andrew Weissman detail in the New York Times, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has regularly indicted people for falsifying business records, the charges likely to be levied against Trump over reimbursements covering the hush money payment. Not charging Trump might constitute special treatment. And if Republicans hold hearings on any such prosecution, Raskin said, this could also allow Democrats to illuminate the charges in a high-profile venue. If and when there is an indictment, we will be able to reconstruct all the facts of this case in a way that makes sense to the American public, Raskin said. The aim, he noted, would be to show the justice process is working and there is no call for extraordinary intervention by the U.S. Congress. Meanwhile, the New York Times reports that last month, one of Trump's lawyers personally prodded Jordan to investigate any coming prosecution. Though that doesn't prove collaboration, congressional aides tell me Democrats will seize on any hearings to publicly grill Republicans on whether they have been communicating with Trump's legal team and if so, how. We've seen this before. During a viral moment at a recent hearing, Representative Daniel S. Goldman, Democrat New York, pressed Jordan directly about meetings Republican committee members held in secret, apparently revealing that Republicans had exaggerated supposedly damning info they claimed to have obtained from whistleblowers. Hearings on charges could produce similarly charged moments. As Goldman told me, they could dramatize how Republicans are using the official power of Congress to effectively coordinate with a criminal defendant, Trump, to obstruct an ongoing criminal investigation. Finally, what's the long-term GOP game plan here? It's likely Bragg will deny the GOP's demand for documents and testimony. Republicans will then have to decide whether to issue subpoenas, which Bragg would likely resist, after which they would have to entertain holding a House vote on whether to refer that to the Justice Department. But do vulnerable House Republicans really want to vote on a criminal referral for law enforcement, all to defend Trump from sleazy hush money charges? It's doubtful. Doing so could yoke the House GOP ever more tightly to Trump. Yet as Democratic aides note, Republicans won't have the option of standing down against Bragg. Trump allies are already beating up on Republicans like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, California, for offering merely qualified defenses of Trump. Republicans will face heavy pressure to maximally wield committee power to shield him, which will intensify as Trump's legal travails deepen. Republicans have no good endgames here, provided Democrats cleverly exploit the situation. A Trump indictment will unleash months of information warfare around a numbingly complex matter never before litigated in the public arena. Democrats sometimes undervalue the importance of sheer creativity in politics, and as ugly as the GOP response has been, Republicans are responding to unprecedented circumstances with new innovations. Democrats must meet them on that battlefield. If there's ever been a topic about which fresh thinking is sorely needed, it's how to fix the banks so they stop doing what they've been doing lately. It's worth casting the net wide to include even ideas that aren't fully developed or that are politically unrealistic. So let's dive in. Issue more treasury bills. Silicon Valley Bank failed in part because it put way too much of its money in long-term treasury bonds, 
which lost value when interest rates rose. Lots of other banks are suffering indigestion from the vast sums of treasury bonds they consumed. They would have been better off owning more treasury bills, which have shorter maturities. Treasury bills aren't as affected by rising interest rates, and investors replace them with higher yielding bills when they mature. Marcus Brunnermeyer, an economist at Princeton University, told me Tuesday that the Treasury Department should give the banking system more of what it needs and less of what it doesn't need by changing how it raises money, selling more bills and fewer bonds. It could still sell some bonds to finance long-term infrastructure projects, Brunnermeyer said. The natural buyers of those bonds would be pension funds and insurance companies, not banks, whose liabilities are short-term. He also said stress tests should gauge banks' ability to cope with rapid increases in interest rates. Stop hide to maturity accounting. Another lesson from Silicon Valley banks' failure is that banks can be at more risk than you'd ever guess by looking at their balance sheets. Securities that they don't plan to sell that they will hold to maturity, in other words, can be recorded on the books at face value even if their market value is much less. One commentator called this high to maturity accounting. Even in good times, revaluing securities every quarter based on market prices would add a lot of volatility to the financial statements. Today, with many banks sitting on huge unrealized losses, it could trigger a panic. As the chart below shows, banks took in lots of deposits early in the pandemic but were losing some of them even before the latest storm. At a minimum, though, once things calm down, stress tests on the banks should verify that a bank would be able to cover all its liabilities, including deposits, if it had to sell all its assets for what the market would bear. Insure all deposits. Protecting all depositors, even those with more than $250,000 in a bank, would eliminate the risk of bank runs. Robert Hockett, a Cornell Law School professor who has been banging the drum for the idea, argued that it would instill faith in small and mid-sized banks and stanch the flow of deposits into a handful of banks that are considered too big to fail. Riskier banks would pay more for their insurance, as they do now. And regulators would have to keep an even closer watch, since uninsured depositors would no longer have a financial incentive to make sure their money was safe. The House's Freedom Caucus said universal deposit insurance would encourage future irresponsible behavior to be paid for by those not involved who follow the rules. That's something to be considered. But the reality is that while the FDIC is supposed to resolve banks in the least costly way possible, it makes exceptions when there's a risk of contagion. That's why uninsured depositors at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were made whole. Uninsured depositors lost just under $100 million in the failure of IndyMac Bank in 2008, according to a spreadsheet the FDIC sent me, but that was an exception. By my calculation, based on the FDIC data, IndyMac alone accounts for 47% of uninsured depositor losses since 1993. Consolidate Regulation People are asking why regulators didn't stop Silicon Valley Bank's blunders in mismanaging its balance sheet. One reason is that its primary regulator was the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, which seemingly wasn't up to the task. The department has announced a comprehensive review of the job it did. The Federal Reserve, which also had oversight authority, repeatedly warned Silicon Valley Bank that it was mismanaging risk, but it never forced action. The good thing about having multiple regulators is that each bank has a lot of eyes on it. The bad thing is the possibility that none of the regulators feel fully responsible. It might be better to have just one federal regulator take clear primary responsibility. The FDIC would be a good candidate particularly if it ends up insuring all deposits. Force banks to borrow less. Anad Edmati, a finance and economics professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, has argued for years that banks are getting away with murder by relying almost entirely on money from depositors and lenders to take risks and make profits. When an investment or loan makes money, the bank and its shareholders keep the upside. 
If enough investments and loans go bad, whoops, the shareholders don't lose very much because they didn't put in very much in the first place and they can walk away if the bank becomes insolvent. The government often steps in to pick up the pieces, privatized gains, socialized losses. Edmati and others have argued that banks should raise much more of their funding from shareholders, as other kinds of companies do. Bank lobbyists have argued that banks have plenty of capital already, but more equity funding is just a good, sensible idea. Make banks narrow. If none of these ideas are extreme enough for you, consider an even bolder one that goes back to the 1930s and comes up every time there's banking turmoil, the narrow bank. A narrow bank would hold deposits entirely in cash, short-term treasury bills or interest-paying reserves at the Federal Reserve. Bank runs would be eliminated and deposit insurance would be unnecessary because depositors would know that even if everyone wanted all their money back the same day, they could get it. Amit Seru, a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, said that there's huge merit to the concept of narrow banking. Brunner Meyer of Princeton said he's not against narrow banking but said that requiring deposit-taking banks to invest only in liquid government securities rather than, say, loans to companies would dry up financing for businesses. Plus, he said, the transition is quite tricky. Banks would have a hard time paying off depositors if they started switching their funds to specialized mutual funds en masse. End leverage. Lawrence Kotlikoff, an economist at Boston University, told me narrow banking is too narrow to deal with two flaws in the broad financial system, leverage and opacity. He has proposed going even further and removing leverage from the entire financial system, not just banks, but also securities firms, insurance companies, and others. His limited-purpose banking limits financial institutions to serving as go-betweens, not gambling with other people's money. The institutions would be set up as equity-funded mutual funds, which are safer than banks because they don't borrow. Mutual funds that hold only cash or reserves at the Fed would take the place of bank deposits. Other mutual funds would finance mortgages and small business loans. As for ending opacity, a new government agency would verify and disclose all mutual fund assets. The status quo is unacceptable, according to Kotlikoff. He told me, even if this crisis calms down, it's just a matter of time before the system fails again. It's a bridge made with rotten timber. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was trying to reassure the public last week when she testified to the Senate Finance Committee that our banking system is sound. But she also said less reassuringly, referring to the run on Silicon Valley Bank, that no matter how strong capital and liquidity supervision are, if a bank has an overwhelming run that's spurred by social media or whatever so that it's seeing deposits flee at that pace, a bank can be put in a danger of failing. If social media can bring down a bank, ID say there's something wrong with the banking system as presently constituted. I hope all of these ideas and others will get a good airing as we figure out how to make sure this doesn't happen yet again. Elsewhere, a bearish signal for the US economy. Even before the banking system turned runny, the conference board's venerable leading economic index was indicating trouble ahead. The index for the U.S. economy fell in February for the 11th straight month, the conference board, a think tank, announced on Friday. Eight of the ten indicators were negative or flat, more than offsetting an increase in stock prices and a better-than-expected report on residential building permits. The current banking turmoil could worsen the outlook if it persists, the conference board said. Justina Zabinska-Lamonica, the senior manager in charge of business cycle indicators, said in a statement that the think tank forecasts rising interest rates paired with declining consumer spending will most likely push the U.S. economy into recession in the near term. Bust out your tiniest violin, because I'm about to stand up for Silicon Valley venture capitalists. The industry is not nearly as insufferable and out of touch as some of its blustering online influencers might lead you to believe. And despite its recent troubles, 
the world continues to need places like Silicon Valley and its financiers of risky ideas. When Silicon Valley Bank was taken over by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, some of the startup world's best-known voices, or, at least, its most aggressively online voices, several of them venture capitalists, swarmed Tividir with shrill demands for a full federal bailout of SVB customers. Whatever the economic merit to making the bank's depositors whole, the V.C.S. sky is falling rhetoric did seem a bit rich. Some of those most clamorous for government intervention in SVB, like David Sachs of Kraft Ventures, have often aligned themselves with Peter Thiel's brand of fairweather libertarianism. When it was their industry's money at stake, though, the long arm of the government apparently looked a lot more comforting. Writing in Slate, Edward Unwiso Jr. argued that their Tividir tantrum over SVB offered a glimpse into how reckless venture capitalists are in pursuit of something they want, so long as it doesn't bear any risk to them. Unwiso teases from VC tweets about the banks. Collapse and indictment of the entire VC business, questioning its essential utility to America's economy and society. As he and other critics note, it's an industry that talks a big game about embracing innovation but has tended to operate as a clubby network of mostly white dudes given to herd like bets on similar ideas. It often props up businesses that profit a few, see crypto and the gig economy, but rarely prioritizes broad social or economic utility. And it has grown its fortunes in unusually fertile ground, more than a decade of low interest rates that sent hundreds of billions of easy money sloshing into V.C.S. coffers. To which I say, okay, but not all V.C.S., and not all the time. Anguiso and other Valley critics aren't off base, but there's a risk in overvilifying the machinery of Silicon Valley based on its noisiest personages in its most frothy times. And while there are lots of flaws in the VC model, I also wonder if it's a bit like that quip about democracy attributed to Churchill, maybe Silicon Valley is the worst way to fund new inventions except for all the others. After all, for all its faults, Silicon Valley has for decades been among the country's most valuable economic assets, along with research funding and other subsidies by the government, it's one of the primary reasons the United States maintains global technological supremacy. It has also produced genuine advances that have improved our lives, from Zoom to Slack and even to gig economy companies like DoorDash, the entire work-at-home apparatus that held up much of the economy through the pandemic was built on the back of venture capital. And while Americans might be burned out on technology, we can't shuck off the need for new things. To address some of humanity's biggest challenges, climate change most pressingly, we will need venture capitalists to fund the best and riskiest ideas. It is VC firms that are financing research into next-generation batteries, new forms of energy and other ways to mitigate the worst effects of global warming. Among Valley investors, Twitter at V.C.S. like Sachs and the angel investor Jason Calacanis are far from the biggest names in town. Though they have a large presence online, they mostly invest millions or tens of millions of dollars at the earliest stages of companies, they are hardly emblematic of the Valley's largest venture firms, which have raised and invested tens of billions of dollars over the years. Nabil Hyatt, a partner at Spark Capital who is one of the Valley's most thoughtful V.C.S., told me that inferring the attitudes of the venture capital industry from its presence on Tividir is like watching the Real Housewives of Orange County and deciding that that's how wives in Orange County act. Many top V.C.S. did not spend the days after S.V.B.S. collapsed tweeting furiously. Some in the industry instead circulated a more sober and substantive letter to officials outlining the risks of contagion. Hyatt and other V.C.S. I spoke with were also doing what V.C.S. are supposed to do, guiding lots of young, fragile companies through a sudden crisis that they were unprepared for. You could call this clubby and herd-like, but you could also call it the secret to Silicon Valley's success. One reason Silicon Valley works is that it collects expertise and institutional knowledge, 
learns from failures, and feeds those insights to succeeding generations of companies. That sort of guidance is exactly why many startups are likely to survive their bank's blow-up. Jessica Lesson, the founder and chief executive of The Information, a publication that covers the startup world and is itself a startup whose money was tied up in SVB, pointed to something that many here have noticed, Silicon Valley now faces more serious scrutiny than it used to, and it does seem to be learning from its mistakes. I've been struck by how much more careful Sam Altman, the chief executive of the ChatGPT inventor OpenAI, is when talking about artificial intelligence than Mark Zuckerberg was when talking about social networking at the dawn of Facebook. Zuckerberg peddled his invention as indisputably good for humanity. Altman, meanwhile, says that while AI can be transformative, he's a little bit scared of how it could be misused by authoritarian governments and how it might affect politics and the economy, and his company keeps that fear at the forefront when building its tech. There was a period about 10 years ago where tech wasn't getting any scrutiny, it was all hype, Lesson said. But we're now well beyond the days of celebrating every new thing that has an app, she added, noting that what's important now is focusing on the right problems. NV.C.S might help solve them. So I guess we're in a new Cold War. Leaders of both parties have become China hawks. There are rumblings of war over Taiwan. Xi Jinping vows to dominate the century. I can't help wondering, what will this Cold War look like? Will this one transform American society the way the last one did? The first thing I notice about this Cold War is that the arms race and the economics race are fused. A chief focus of the conflict so far has been microchips, the little gizmos that not only make your car and phone work, but also guide missiles and are necessary to train artificial intelligence systems. Whoever dominates chip manufacturing dominates the market as well as the battlefield. Second, the geopolitics are different. As Chris Miller notes in his book Chip War, the microchip sector is dominated by a few highly successful businesses. More than 90% of the most advanced chips are made by one company in Taiwan. One Dutch company makes all the lithography machines that are required to build cutting-edge chips. Two Santa Clara, California, companies monopolize the design of graphic processing units, critical for running AI applications in data centers. These choke points represent an intolerable situation for China. If the West can block off China's access to cutting-edge technology, then it can block off China. So China's intention is to approach chip self-sufficiency. America's intention is to become more chip self-sufficient than it is now and to create a global chip alliance that excludes China. American foreign policy has been rapidly rearranged along these lines. Over the last two administrations, the United States has moved aggressively to block China from getting the software technology and equipment it needs to build the most advanced chips. The Biden administration is cutting off not just Chinese military companies, but all Chinese companies. This seems like a common sense safeguard, but put another way, it's kind of dramatic. Official U.S. policy is to make a nation of almost a billion and a half people poorer. I'm even more amazed by how the new Cold War is rearranging domestic politics. There have always been Americans, stretching back to Alexander Hamilton's report on manufacturers in 1791, who supported industrial policy, using government to strengthen private economic sectors. But this governing approach has generally been on the margins. Now it is at the center of American politics when it comes to both green technology and chips. Last year, Congress passed the CHIPS Act with $52 billions in grants, tax credits, and other subsidies to encourage American chip production. That's an industrial policy that would leave Hamilton gaping and applauding. 
Over the next years and decades, China is going to pour immense amounts of money into its own industrial policy programs across a range of cutting-edge technologies. One analyst from the Center for Strategic and International Studies estimates China already spends over 12 times as much of its GDP on industrial programs as the United States does. Over these coming years, U.S. leaders will have to figure out how effective that spending is and how to respond. Even more than the last Cold War, this one will be waged by technological elites. Both sides are probably going to be spending lots of money on their most educated citizens, a dangerous situation in an age of populist resentments. Already you can begin to see a new set of political fissures. In the center are the sort of neo-Hamiltonians who supported the CHIPS Act, including the Biden administration and the 17 non-Trumpy Republicans who voted with Democrats for the act in the Senate. On the right, there are already a range of populists who are super hawkish on China when it comes to military affairs, but don't believe in industrial policy. Why should we spend all that money on elites? What makes you think the government is smarter than the market? On the left are those who want to use industrial policy to serve progressive goals. The Biden administration has issued an incredible number of diktats for companies that receive CHIPS Act support. These diktats would force businesses to behave in ways that serve a number of extraneous progressive priorities, child care policy, increased unionization, environmental goals, racial justice, etc. Rather than being a program focused on boosting chips, it seeks to be everything all at once. One would hope that as the Cold War atmosphere intensifies, our politics will get more serious. When Americans went to the polls during the last Cold War, they realized their vote could be a matter of life and death. It may feel like that again. Governing during this era will require extraordinary levels of experienced statesmanship, running industrial programs that don't become bloated, partially deglobalizing the economy without setting off trade wars, steadily outcompeting China without humiliating it. If China realizes it is falling further behind every year, then an invasion of Taiwan may be more imminent. Miller was asked what were the odds that over the next five years a dangerous military clash between the United States and China would produce an economic crisis equivalent to the Great Depression. He put the odds at 20%. That seems high enough to focus the mind. At the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, we stand in the same position relative to the initial invasion as America stood in 1985 relative to the 1965 arrival of our first combat troops in Vietnam. This makes it a useful moment to compare the two conflicts and their effects, and to consider, provisionally, always provisionally, which was more disastrous, which intervention deserves to be remembered as the worst foreign policy decision in our history. For some time, even after my own initial support for the war dissolved and its folly became obvious, I doubted that Iraq could outstrip Vietnam in the ranks of American debacles. More than 12 times as many American troops died in the Vietnam War as died in Operation Iraqi Freedom and its aftermath. The bloodletting among Iraqis was terrible, but so was the civilian toll in Southeast Asia. The United States lost the Vietnam War completely, in Iraq we left behind an unsteady and corrupt republic rather than a new dictatorship, with a government that still allows an American military presence. Domestically, the period around the Vietnam War was dreadful, a wave of domestic terrorism, a crisis of authority, the 1960s curdling into the 1970s. The immediate aftermath of Iraq was sour and paranoid in its own way. But even with the Great Recession there wasn't the same kind of radicalism and social breakdown. When Barack Obama was elected president, American conservatism seemed shattered by Iraq, as American liberalism was shattered by Vietnam, but by his second term there was a return to ideological stalemate. At various times, then, at the 10th anniversary of the war, maybe even at the 15th, 
it was possible to imagine a long-term future where Iraq was ultimately remembered more like our bloody counterinsurgency in the Philippines at the dawn of the 20th century than like the trauma of Vietnam. As a bad war, but not an era-defining one. As a squandering of blood and treasure and moral credibility, but one whose overarching strategic costs were not so great. But today there's a stronger case for seeing Iraq as a more epical disaster. In American domestic life the Vietnam effect was more of a fever, whereas the Iraq effect seems like a wasting or relapsing disease. The war's influence has percolated inside other social crises, like the opioid epidemic, that have become more visible and destructive over time. Its lingering effects have made the body politic more susceptible to left-wing radicalism and right-wing demagogy, while contributing to a persistent mood of pessimism and disappointment that's then been exacerbated by other forces, social media, the coronavirus pandemic. In our political coalitions, these disillusioning effects look even more substantial and permanent than they appeared in 2010 or 2015. Ever since the war discredited and helped dissolve the hawkish center-left, nobody has been able to reconstitute a strong centrist faction within liberalism, with the result that liberal institutions have been pulled ever leftward since 2004. Ever since the war discredited both neoconservatism specifically and the Republican establishment generally, nobody has been able to maintain a successful counterweight to the various forms of right-wing populism, Tea Party, and Trumpian that have made the GOP ungovernable and incapable of governing. And there is a special irony that even with the intellectual ferment on the Trump-era right, the attempts to forge a national conservatism or a socially conservative populism sometimes look like efforts to grope backward to George W. Bush's platform in 2000, before he traded his humble foreign policy for a grand crusade. But it is in the effect on America's global position that the costs of the Iraq war really keep compounding. It's now clear that not just the war alone but its ever-spreading secondary consequences, which included our futile overinvestment in Afghanistan, faithfully cast as the good war by many Democrats opposed to the Iraq invasion, kept us tied us down during critical years of geopolitical realignment, making it hard to even think about let alone cope with the revival of Russian power and the rise of China to superpower status. The all but certain influence of our final defeat in Afghanistan on Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine was just one link in a long chain of consequences forged by the Iraq War. Likewise, our newly aggressive posture toward the Chinese regime is a risky attempt to play catch-up to shifts that we should have been more attuned to a decade ago. And while the effects of the Iraq War on the developing world's attitudes toward the United States can be overstated, our initial invasion clearly made us seem like a less trustworthy hegemon, reckless and revisionist rather than steady and reliable. Then the way the war contributed to our internal divisions and derangements also made American culture seem less admirable and the broader liberal democratic project seem less inevitable. So not only Russia and China but other power centers, from India to Turkey, were pushed toward post-American and post-Western paths by everything that followed. Now return to the comparison between 2023 and our Reagan-era situation, barely a decade after the last helicopters left Saigon. By 1985, we had managed to separate China from Russia, the Soviet economy was faltering and Mikhail Gorbachev had just been elected General Secretary of the Communist Party with Glasnost and the fall of the Berlin Wall just around the corner. Today, with Russia and China increasingly aligned together against us and Chinese influence increasing, we seem to be descending back into the kind of twilight struggle that in 85 we were poised to finally transcend. So if Vietnam 20 years on looked like a disaster that in our strength we were able to absorb, a surmountable obstacle to American ascent, Iraq 20 years on looks more like our empire's nemesis, full stop. Of course, appearances can be deceiving. Almost nobody in 1985 realized just how quickly the Soviet Union would collapse, and perhaps today the American comeback is already beginning. We have resources and forms of legitimacy that are lacking in our more authoritarian rivals, 
their systems are persistently vulnerable to the follies of autocratic decision-making. And the Ukraine conflict, for some, is seen as a possible doorway to revival, reinvigorating the West much as Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and John Paul II once did, drawing Putin into the same sort of quagmire that Afghanistan offered to the Soviets, helping us shake our Iraq distemper on a different timetable than with our Vietnam syndrome, but with similar results. It's not a coincidence that among those most invested in this hope are some of the Iraq War's most ardent advocates. They want redemption, understandably, for their vision of American power, if not for the Iraq decision itself. I don't share their optimism, but am not surprised at its resilience. Especially when the alternative possibility, that a single choice made with such confidence 20 years ago still has our empire on a sunset path today, seems too terrible to bear.